I'm Emily Schnall with Dinosaur Channel. We're here with Curator of Vertebrate Paleontology at the Academy of Natural Sciences, Dr. Ted Deschler. We're going to learn how he became a paleontologist. Dr. Deschler, thank you for inviting us. Uh, pleasure, thank you for being here. Love to talk to you. So, when did you first become interested in becoming a paleontologist? You know, um, as a kid I always knew I wanted to do earth sciences and went to college and studied geology, thought maybe I'd do marine biology even, something like that. But after studying rocks and fossils in college, I started to connect to fossils and really thought this would be a great career. So you said you studied geology and earth sciences, so what subjects particularly did you have to study in school to become a paleontologist? Yeah, um, the most useful classes for me were certainly history of the earth, or mm -hmm. sometimes called historical geology, which is where you really do sort of put time to the earth and you understand the, the long, long periods of time and the, the major changes as continents have moved around the earth and oceans have changed and weather and everything has, that the earth is always dynamic, right? And the history of life you know, studying paleontology was just sort of another layer. So I really enjoyed historical geology. Um, I think a few of the core classes, like the intro to chemistry, is a really important piece mm -hmm. for, for any science major, really. Honestly, I haven't used my math too much, but you still should probably study math, <laughs> get reasonably proficient at it. Um, and then getting into geology specifically, I think uh, those hands-on classes, those classes where you learn about the variety of fossils, whether they're backboned animals or what we call invertebrate fossils, shelled things and trilobites and all that, those are all really important foundation to get into your specialization as a paleontologist. So how do you know where to find fossils? Yeah, in large part, knowing where to find fossils has to do with understanding geology. So certain layers of rock from certain time periods have the potential to preserve fossils from those times. As a paleontologist, we think about that stuff. What time period are we interested in? What sorts of environments do we need to sample? And then we go to the, the geological literature, whether it's a map or a scientific paper that tells us where those kinds of rocks are on the surface of the earth today. Now some people just go out and look at rocks and hope they find fossils. That can work, but it wouldn't be as much of a research project in that case. It would be more of a, for fun, I'm going out to find mm -hmm. fossils. What would you recommend to kids who want to become a paleontologist? Okay, to become a paleontologist. Of course, an interest in nature and mm -hmm. the earth, so earth sciences. So you want to have an interest in those things, able to, to take a geology class. So there's really two sides. One is that sort of geological side, but then there's also the biological side of, of a paleontologist. So taking class in a biology class, and if there's some evolutionary biology as part of that, that's terrific. But then there's other pieces as well that I think are helpful. Stuff like illustration. I think being able to draw something, to observe it and draw it, makes you notice the details of it. Any aspiring scientist needs to practice those skills of, of noticing the things, and the best way to do that is, is to draw it and be comfortable with your drawings. You know, it doesn't have to be a piece of art, but it needs to be accurate, right? So illustration is a, a good skill. And otherwise, and it's kind of part of biology, is anatomy, right? You know, your turkey that you eat on Thanksgiving, the the x-ray you might see of your dog's leg if, if, if you get an x-ray at the vet or something like that. So if you're a paleontologist, especially a vertebrate paleontologist, someone working on backboned animals, anatomy is anatomy is anatomy, whether it's yours or a dinosaur's or even some of the ancient fish I study, that's a really useful skill as well. So Dr. Deschler, you've discovered a lot of really great fossils, but can you tell us a little bit about the most famous one, Tiktaalik? Glad to, yeah. Um, I started out focusing on this Devonian time period, the late part of the Devonian. So really from about 360 to about 380 million years ago. And that's been a research interest of mine now for about 20 years. The best thing we found was way up in the Canadian Arctic. We came upon a site that produced 
an animal that's recognized as a really good transition between finned and limbed animals. It's about 375 million years old, Tiktaalik rose. Um, so that's probably been the best thing that we found. But I noticed there's a lot of fossils around this room. Are there any others around here with really cool stories? Oh, gosh. Almost everything here has, has a neat story behind it. Uh, Cabinus next to us has Hadrosaurus foci, one of oh, the wow. earliest fossil dinosaurs found. Would you mind showing us a few? No, glad to, glad to help. Hadrosaurus foci, the famous 1858 discovery, Haddonfield, New Jersey, lower limb bones, vertebrae, toe bones, a few pieces of skull, and the upper limb, and some more vertebrae in the hips. That's the entirety of Hadrosaurus fulci. Important, important early dinosaur fossil. This is the type specimen of Tiktaalik rose, and it's, it's one of the first specimens we found, but we have more now, although this is still one of the most complete. We're looking from the snap up the skull, the eye sockets, back to the back of the skull, the shoulder girdles with fin material, and then scales covering the back. We collected this and did all the fossil preparation work between 2004 and about 2006. But we continue to find new stuff and, and, and prepare new stuff as well of this and all the animals that live with it. But it's been a really interesting animal. You notice the head is sort of shaped a little bit like crocodiles and other features help us understand that it probably lived in shallow water. And, and the kinds of rocks where we find it also suggest stream deposits of that sort. So really what we're looking at is a fish, let's call it a fish, that is specializing for moving around in shallow water and using its fins in a bit more of a limb-like way. A lot of specific features helps us place it at that transition between finned and limbed animals. So here's the turtle I was telling you about. Wow. One half found in the early 1800s, 2012, fossil collector found the other half, brought it in, boom. That's insane. The exact same individual. Two sides fit together like a glove.